So for our Sunday school lesson this morning, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> the title of my message is Members in Particular. Uh, you can be turning to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm only going to read one verse for now. I'm going to come back to it. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. I want to talk today about the body of Christ, that body which is made up of many members. But we can, cannot talk about the body unless we first talk about the head. So I want to go through some things concerning the body of Christ and his church, especially as it concerns the local assembly. But I want to do it in relation to Jesus Christ as the head, simply because you do not have the body without the head. I want to see what he has been pleased to do and to tell us in his scripture with what his purpose was to the church and for the church. So I have two points, and that's Christ the head and his body, the church. So let's first look at Christ is the head. First of all, we know he is the chief cornerstone or the head cornerstone. Jesus Christ is that cornerstone that, bought, that brought both Jew and Gentile together, making them one new man. He is also that chief cornerstone that is the foundation that salvation is built for all believers. He is that stone where two walls of rebellion, both Jew and Gentile, are united into one new righteous man. He is also that cornerstone which started the building and is level and straight so that everything that is built must be built on that stone or it will fall. This stone is also that stone that should it fall, it will grind, fall on you, it will grind you to powder. But if you fall on this stone, you will be broken. Being broken doesn't sound like it's a, a good thing here, but if you know this stone, you know that you want to be broken by him. It is certainly better than the alternative, which is being ground to powder. <clears throat> but this stone in falling on him will bring you safety because you will be healed. You can read this in several places, but I'm going to read two passages where it tells you these, these things that I've just said. Turn with me to Luke 20 now, if you would. Sorry, I had you turn to the other passage, but Luke 20 and verse 17. <clears throat> and he beheld them and said what is this then that is written the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now I want to read Acts 4, and you all don't have to turn to all these passages. I'm going to be turning to a lot of passages today, but if you want to follow along, Acts 4. <laughs> Acts 4, verse uh, 10, and 10 through 12. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. <clears throat> so, I want to talk about the head of the church, and this is uh, this stone is the head of the church. It's it's specific about 
and I want to specifically let me talk about him being head of the church, and this is not different a different headship, it's just getting more specific as to whom his headship is towards. I've heard the analogy that there is only one captain on a ship. To this statement I do not disagree. However, this analogy was given to me in reference to there being only one pastor for a local assembly. But the analogy for me, based on what I know from Scripture, is that Christ Jesus is the ship and he is the captain of the ship. He has on this ship many members of whom all might do different things based on what he has given to them. <clears throat> In 2 Chronicles 13, 12, we read this. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain and his priest with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you, O children of Israel. Fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. He is the ship itself or our ark of salvation. We have the ark. We know the ark is a picture of Christ. He is the vessel to, that will bring me into safety and also the one that will guide the vessel to safety, being my captain. One more passage I want to give you concerning Christ being our captain. In Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 11, we read this. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is that Christ which is the head of the church. But let's look further. Ephesians, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians 1. In verse 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now let me say this before I continue. The local assembly is a part of the church. The local assembly is a member in particular, and I would even say it consists of members in particular. It always talks about his church, even when he is talking about a local assembly because they are a direct display of his body, the church, if you will. We have the example of God Almighty gave us in his word of him being head of the church. But let's look further at the analogy that God gives of him being head of the church, and that is the husband and wife. Turn a little further to Ephesians 5 and verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So he is the head of the church. The analogy given by God Almighty, who breathed his word, and these men wrote it down, gives us the analogy of husband and wives as being a picture of Christ and his church. Listen, this is not a picture of the pastor and the local assembly. <clears throat> Why is this so important to know? Well, in Colossians 1.18, it says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The preeminence is not the pastor. It is Jesus Christ our Lord, head, the head, and the captain of our salvation. 
We are certainly to love our pastors and to honor them, and in some cases even doubly honor them. But they do not have the preeminence. Christ Jesus the Lord does. What they know and what they have comes from Christ himself, if they preach Christ and him crucified. Christ is the head of the church and therefore the only head of the local assembly. God in his word never talks about the local assembly any different than he talks about his church. This is God's word, folks, and if I by his grace want to bow down to his word and what he says about things, if this results in others not understanding things or getting confused about things and how they are done, or if it results in them not wanting me to be around or not wanting me to be around them, <clears throat> then so be it. I am a sinner undone, undone without Jesus Christ. My only hope is Jesus Christ. I want to know what he says in his word and not what a preacher says to me. If a preacher tells me what God Almighty says in his word, it is not him that says it. But God is saying this to me, and I will find it in his word. When a preacher tells you something and he says it is found in God's word, then look at God's word and see if that is what God is saying. We are told to do this, and if we do this, we are noble in doing so. God by his spirit will confirm these things to your heart and that they are the words of Christ and we are told to try the spirits. Now I want to talk about Jesus Christ's body, his church. Christ's body, his church. His body is his fullness. That's what scripture says. We are a part of Jesus Christ just as we see the analogy given by God of a husband and wife being one flesh, so are Christ and his church. We have already read in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 that we are the body and he is the head. Those who are his are a part of his church, his body, but each believer is a member of his body. In Ephesians 5, 30 it says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So many members. Christ's body has many members and, members, and each of those members are dealt by God the measure of faith as he sees fit. Each of those members have different offices or functions. He has in his word given us some details to some of these offices and functions. We see in his word that we, are, that we who are his are all members of the same body. In Romans 12, uh, turn with me to Romans 12 for a minute. Verses 3 through 5. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Just as our body is, we have the head and then we have the torso. The torso has many members. It has fingers and toes, hands and feet, arms and legs, and each of those have many different members that help or work together for them to operate. We have internal organs, <clears throat> that have specific functions, and all these are needed for the body to operate as it should. If one part is not working, then the rest of the body suffers. All members have specific functions that they perform, and they are all needed. 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. Verses 12 through 14. <laughs> For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And then uh, again in, in verse 26, go down to verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. We are not by ourselves. We do not operate by ourselves. We are all a part of his body, and every one is needed because he has deemed them needed. To his body he gives gifts, though. Jesus Christ has given gifts to his church. Now these gifts are not separate from the body. They are a part of the body. It is one body working in a unified whole in the way that he has seen fit to put it together. Everything given is given by him. He distributes these gifts and gives these gifts in the measure that he sees fit. He knows our need and what he gives is exactly what is needed for his body wherever it is given. In Romans 12 where we have already read, it continues on in verses 6 through 8. It says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth, on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth, with diligence, he that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. Also in, in Ephesians 4 and 10, we read this, 10 and 11. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And again, in 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> in verses 4 through 11, it reads this. <clears throat> now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all and in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, <clears throat> to another faith by the same Spirit, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self, the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. These gifts certainly do include bishops, elders, and pastors, but I do not believe they are all necessarily exclusive to them. What is the purpose of these gifts? In Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, we read this. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, ye, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Where, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, 
and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which ever joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the purpose is for perfecting and edification of the body. That's what these gifts are for. So it is for the complete furnishing and building up of the body of Christ. This is to be done until we all come in the unity of the faith to the knowledge and fullness of Christ so that we be, will not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine or that we will not be deceived by those men who are lying in wait to purposely try to deceive us. It is for the edification of the body. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says this, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. <clears throat> so now that we see that Jesus Christ is the head and he has his body, which he has fitly joined together so that it works as he has been pleased for it to, he gives each of the members the measure of faith as he sees fit. He gives gifts to the church and the purpose that he has done this is to edify his body. Now that we know this from scripture, I want to briefly talk about pastors. God breathed these words just as he did the rest of his scripture. He means for us to see and know these things because he has given this to us in his word. These are important because he is the head of the corner, the substitute for his people that has purposed and given all things according to his will. First, as it concerns bishops, elders, and pastors and teachers. These terms are all talking about the same person. Although there may be some different functions, you know, I've heard people say that, you know, some of these might talk about different functions. I don't necessarily disagree with that. <clears throat> the scripture uses each of these terms. They're all talking about the same person, you might say. What is the first factor for a man being a bishop? First Timothy uh, 3. If you'll turn with me there. First Timothy 3. So what's the first factor for someone being an elder, a bishop, or a pastor? <clears throat> well, I guess I need to get in the right book. I'm in 2 Timothy. Okay, 1 Timothy 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So the first thing is a man has to desire the office of a bishop. We know there are qualifications of those who might desire this office. I'm not going to go into all of those. I will one later. But, but those who desire this office are also proved. It says this when it speaks of deacons, but I believe it is referring to both, but they are to be proved. If they are proved, then they are in this office. So how many bishops, elders, pastors, and teachers should a local assembly have? Well, how many desire the office of a bishop and have been proved? Are you going to tell a man no when God is sending that man to preach his word? 
God Almighty, just as he does with any that he sends to preach his word, gives them the, the desire to do so. It is clear that it first starts with a desire to have the office of a bishop according to this scripture. So this passage does not necessarily say there should be multiple elders. But where else do we read that there are more than one of these men in the local assembly? Turn with me to Titus 1. Titus 1. And I just want to show this. I want to turn to these passages because I want to show this is what God's word says. Titus 1 and verse 5. <clears throat> For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, plural, more than one, in every city, singular, one, as I had appointed thee. Now, I've heard some say that back in those days in, in a city that uh, people did not travel very far. So in every city, there would have been multiple local assemblies in one city. Just for the sake of argument, let's say this is so. I do not believe that that's what this is saying because of other passages that we have read in Scripture. What else do we read in God's Word concerning this? In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 27 through 29, it says this. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let, let him speak to himself and to God. And here it is. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. Now I want to read you what uh, John Gill says about this. And, you know, I don't get my, <laughs> I don't get what God's word says from a commentary, but he says exactly as I see this passage saying. So let me read this, what he said, commented on this passage here. Let the prophet speak two or three. The apostle, having finished the rules for speaking with an unknown tongue, proceeds to lay down some, of, some for the gift of prophesying and observes that where there are a number of prophets, as very likely there were in the church at Corinth, two or three of them might prophesy or explain the prophecies of the Old Testament or preach the gospel at one opportunity or meeting. He does not use that restrictive clause at most as, as before because if there was any necessity or occasion for it, more might be employed so that care was taken not to burden the people and send them away loathing. And this they were to do, as before, in course, one after another. Otherwise, it would be all confusion, nor could they be heard to edification. Though some have thought that they might speak together at one and the same time in different parts of the church. And then it says, and let the other judge, the other prophets that sit and hear, and all such as have a spirit of discerning, whether what the prophet says comes from their own spirits or from a lying spirit, from the spirit of Antichrist, or whether from the spirit of God, and even the body of the people, private members of the church, and hearers might judge of the doctrine for themselves, according to the word of God, the standard of faith and practice, and were not to believe every spirit, but try them, whether they were of God, and their doctrines by his word, whether they were true or false. For the spiritual man is in a measure capable of judging all things of a spiritual kind. Through that spiritual experience he has of the word of God and divine things, and by the assistance of the spirit of God. If you have more than one bishop, elder, pastor, prophet, it says here, but it's the same thing, it's what it's talking about, then they can all speak one at a time. No one could understand anything if they all spoke at one time. This is clear. This is talking about them all being in one place and is at a given time. <clears throat> God gives the measure of faith and he gives the gifts. These men are also told this in 1 Peter 5 in verse 1 and 2. The elders, again plural, which are among you, all in one place, I exhort. 
who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So God's men are to feed the flock. This is their function. The head has given them the feed, which is his word. All we are are servants and ministers. We are serving those sheep God has given to his church in the local assembly where they are found or whatever God sends them to feed, wherever God sends them to feed. And they have the same rule book right here. Everybody has it here, I believe. So, you know, someone has uh, said, how can two or three rule in one place? Somebody has to be in charge. You've got the same rule book right here. 1 Peter 5.3 5, 3 says this, going on in the passage. Neither as being lords, and this word lords means this, the, to lord against, that is control or subjugate, exercise dominion over, be lord over, overcome. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Being in samples, we are to tell men and women the truth about God and about ourselves. In action, we might show them what to do and in some cases what not to do. Or we might have to say something that we shouldn't have done or something that we should have done. This is being an, an in sample. But going on with the passage in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Me, as someone who has not preached as long as Walter and Joe have, I submit myself to them. I you know, they can, whatever they say to be done, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to submit to them. They've done it longer. <clears throat> this includes those who are not elders as well. We should all do that, submit ourselves to them. But it also says here to subject, your, be subject one to another. So this is something we all should be doing, be subject one to another. I want to go back briefly and mention one qualification of a bishop. In 1 Timothy 3 and 2, it says this. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober. This word means safe, safe in mind. That is, self-controlled, moderate as to opinion or passion, discreet, sober, temperate. So a pastor is to be moderate in his opinions. None of us are without our opinions, and all of us will let it be known what our opinion is from time to time. But this says that a bishop should be moderate in his opinion, meaning he does not have to spew forth his opinion about things all the time. This is what the head of the body, the chief cornerstone, has purposed, and he purposed for the edification of the body. Now let's read our text that we started with, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, if you would turn with me there. <clears throat> now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administration but the same Lord, and there are diversities of op operations but it is the same God which worketh all in all. 
but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were, were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So what does it say in this passage? Christ the head has given to his church many different gifts. Some members have one gift and others have another. All members being members in particular have been given specifically by God Almighty. Jesus Christ, so that the body has no schism, no division in other words. He has so put his body together that it all works as it should. If it does not work together as it should, then the whole body suffers. We are, we are to all look to the head, which is our salvation. He's both the vessel of it and the controller of it. We are complete in him. Are we not? Yes. Colossians 2.10 says this, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. If we are not holding to the head, we will have problems. Yeah. We are in fact to be watchful that no man beguile us into hold, not holding to the head. Because he says from this head, he says from this head that all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. That's what it says in Colossians 2 and verse 19. We should be about preaching Christ and Him crucified. We should be unified in that and caring for one another, lifting up weak hands and rejoicing with those who rejoice. Because Christ is our head and has purposed and carried out that purpose to care for His body, he has redeemed them from the curse of the law being made a curse for them. Help us all to look to Christ and to love one another, not being high-minded but fearing God, knowing the pit from whence we were digged, always looking to our head, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord God, thank you for allowing us to gather here together. Be with those that uh, are not here for sicknesses, comfort them in, with the comfort that you are pleased to comfort them with, with the words of your Son, dear Lord. Just comfort them knowing that, uh, that Christ does all things well. 
be with Walter as he stands to speak here, and he may speak in spirit and truth. Be with us all, dear Lord, to look to your word and what you tell us to do and just stand for the truth, dear Lord. Because all might, all power is yours, and, and we will not be able to do it unless you do it in us. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.